Uh, the first question says, Imam, what if I make a mistake during my prayer? While I'm standing praying, I think in my head, maybe I've made four rakah or I've made three. Say, for example, I'm praying in Shah. I think, oh, I've made four rakah or three rakah. What do I do in that instance? So I'll pass the mic to you. Uh, on our way here, I was telling uh, uh, Brother Amadou, Alaji Amadou, I was telling him, Amadou, you know what? When I talk to the Muslims, I'm not afraid. Why? Because I believe I must be one of two people. I may give them the right information, they will support me, and they may prove it to me that I'm wrong, and they will teach me. So we don't need to be afraid. With Islam, we have been told what you know you say, and what you don't know you say, I don't know. It's that simple. Yeah. And then when you deal with a Muslim, our fear should be less, because there is a criteria. Not up to the way I think or my culture, it is a divine teaching. And this is the Quran and the Hadith, and we have the right to anybody who provided with something Islamic, can you please, please no. Yes, confirm it. It is our right to know that anyway. Yeah. To make sure that we are not following somebody's culture, my culture, or somebody else's, that is how simple it is in Islam. You know, and with, with this question, as we know that you know, forgetfulness is part of the name of the human being. Yeah. The human being forgets. And simply when we see in the life of the Prophet you know, when he was supposed to pray for Raqqa, but he prayed for Raqqa and he gave Salam. And he was sure everything is fine. And the Sahaba, they did nothing about it. They did not dare to say, Oh, Messenger of Allah, you prayed only two rakah. Because they believed that he is a prophet. Maybe there is some chance had been done to the Salah. So nobody said anything except one Sahabi, Zulia Dain. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, did you forget? Or a new thing happened? about the salah. And the Prophet وسلم, said, no, I didn't forget. And no chance has been done to the salah either. He said, yes, it happened. You prayed only two rakah. And the Prophet asked other people, is that correct? Said, yes. And he said, okay, stand up. We pray two more rakah. And when you come to two more rakah, all you need to do, before you give the salah, you make two sekida. We call that the sekida of forgetfulness. So when you go to the people of the ulama, if I'm praying and then I'm in doubt, is this my fourth raka or my third? Something we are sure the third is done. We are doubtful about the fourth. And the ulama of perfect they say, Yabni al aqal. We build on the less. Because between three and four, that means surely that the third one is done, so just stand up and bring number four. And then all you need to do. You do say it at Saho. And this say it at Saho, you could do it before you give the salam in the Shafi way, or you could do it after you give the salam either way. That goes back to you know, another Ishtihad uh, among the uh, scholars of the Fatha. But that's what we need to do. When you have doubt, did I do four or three? Always build on the less. Say, okay, I did three. And then let's bring number four and do the say it at Saho, and, and that way it's done. Inshallah, we will take the opportunity after today. I know we will not go into translating this to Creole or people of our sisters or those who want to have it translated. But Inshallah, we, we have taken the summary and at our next meeting we will make sure this is uh, passed on uh, in Fula also to the community, Inshallah. So we'll go to the next question. The next question says, how to pay someone who I owe money but they've passed away and have no family members. So someone I owe money passed away but don't have any family members around me. How do I pay that person? That he knows. Yeah? That he or she knows. That he or she, somebody owes someone someone money, but the person they owe the money to has died, but then they don't know anyone around that is a family member. How do they pay that money or pay the money back? Exactly. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. 
the point. This means, as we know that, we still can do good to people who die. But how? In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said to us, when you make a dua for someone absent, one of the dua that Allah will hear and listen and accept is when you pray for someone absent from your heart. Because if you really pray for someone when they're not around, it means you witness in your life that human being has been good. And you are talking to Allah as a, a witness on earth. So far we live together. I witness that that person is good. Oh Allah, forgive them. It is something we really need. One thing to benefit from our social life, to make sure that in our absence, when they think of us, they will pray for us. That means we have been good citizens with them. And as we say, anything that belongs to Allah, He may forgive us. But what belongs to people, it still doesn't belong to us. What we need to do, we give it as a charity. And then, this reward will go to them anyway. Because it's something that doesn't belong to me. But the person already passed away. We can say, oh, the person passed away and I owe them. We put it in their saving account. And how to add something to somebody's saving account is to give it as a sadaqah. And the reward will go to them because it is a property. Just like when somebody died, and in their name we make like a, a well in the village for people or build a mosque. It is a sadaqah for them and it goes to the saving account. Is that one way we can do to people who we owe and send it to them through the way of the sadaqah? Allah Thank you. I think that's very clear. Thank you. And the third question here from the ladies are also how to pray at night time, which is the hajjud. How do they, how someone, how can someone make the hajjud prayers at night? And what is the best time to do it? Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Tatajafa junubuhum anil madawajya Yadaona rabbahum khawfahum wa tama'a Wa mimma rizaknahum yunfikun As we know that praying during the night That was salihin It is the attitude And the lifestyle Of the righteous people Getting this habit If somebody really can sacrifice The night and do this type of uh, voluntary salah, can you imagine about the fart? But how to pray the night salat? The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam uh, said, salatu layli matna matna. The night prayer is two raka, two raka. And when you feel like you are going to sleep, then you end it with the witr salat. And we know the witr salat is the whole salat. So you pray two raka, you pray two, two, two four, six, Eight, ten, twelve, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he didn't do more than twelve anyway. But as when we do two raka, two raka, two raka, and the last one is the winter, the odd, the odd one, and we end it like that. And the best time, of course, is the last third of the night. The one is closer to the Subh Salat, to pay the Tahajjud. But Tahajjud will start after the Isha anyway. But the best time is the only moving to wait for the Subh Salat. That is the best time for me that I had to. Thank you. Thank you, man. So the last question from the lady's slide, inshallah, it's about scandal. What to do if someone says something about you and does not make you happy? So if someone goes around and spoiling your names and saying things bad, how do how, what to what to do about that person? Uh, first of all, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. إن الذين يحبون أن تشيع الفاحشة في الذين آمنوا لهم عذاب أليم في الدنيا والآخرة. Those people who love scandal to spread among those who believe, they have a severe عذاب now and then in الدنيا and the آخرة. First of all, really, Islamically, what the Prophet told us: المؤمنون بعدهم لبعض نصحة. والمنافقون بعضهم لبعض غششة. The believers to each other, they advise each other. And the hypocrites to each other, they cheat each other. And it can be a disease. If I see myself, what I do in my social life is to go 
and knock somebody else's glory down in order to build mine, I can see and tell you that I have the spiritual poverty. Because this is the attitude of people, someone who failed, and in order to raise themselves up, I just have to try to knock down the glory of other people. And truly, as we know that, nobody can be safe from that, including the Prophet Muhammad Whatever we can imagine or show some problems, he went through it. But as we know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you up, nobody can put you down. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you down, nobody can put you up. So this will remain a social and moral problem. And we can control ourselves, but we cannot control others. And the day they decide to get out of that darkness, we say hooray to them, congratulations. Now you're becoming a real living human being. You know, but first of all, you know, we just try to avoid that to go. Anybody who talk behind you, just realize that you are victorious because they are afraid of you. They have to talk behind the curtains. So they are, they are defeated and that is a sign. So we should not worry about it. Only people who face you, we need to just clarify it. Because this is a man-to-man -man issue. And if I only talk behind the curtains, that is a proof that I am entirely defeated and I don't have the, the courage to tell the person in the face because I know that I'm wrong. So we shouldn't worry about that. And it is part of the blessing of Allah in that He makes us, we, don't, we cannot tell other people's mind. So we don't know what they have against us. So get, let it go. And remember what having been said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we find the person, one of the Imam, and I, I can't remember his name now, he used to, uh, to give present when he hears something like that. If somebody backbite him, talk bad about him, and he come to know, he will prepare something very nice and go and give it to the person. The person. Why? Because you gave me your good deeds. You spoke behind me ill, and your good deeds coming to my parents. So thank you for helping me. So if you really like somebody, don't talk behind them. So it should not be the attitude of a believer. And we do ourselves, you know, it is a thing. Will I ever go to the toilet and take everything in it and put it in myself and go out there? Look very bad. This is a physical film. Scandal and this type of thing is, is worse. How can I carry that in the best part of my body? This is my heart. We shouldn't be like that. You know, that means we are low and very, very low. We have to get out of that film. Thank you. This is very true. I'm just to confirm that, you know, Imam just said, you can't read people's mind. And I have said in the Quran, in the Bible, tell me, it's mun fala tajassasu. So it's just a confirmation. Don't say somebody is talking behind you. Don't. The that in itself is, 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 is committing crime. So we shouldn't be doing that. And inshallah, no, we have heard from Imam. And the, now it's the time for the men and the ladies are still welcome to ask more questions. Inshallah. Now the next question goes to from the brothers here. If someone, uh, husband died, if I get it wrong, please correct me. If someone has been died, and uh, they, is it uh, when a day, is it compulsory for the woman to have a dam? Muni for four months. Muni, 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 okay, Muni in Korea. So if the husband died, is it compulsory for the person to sit and have that edda and then have a husband after that? Okay. And the other part of this question is that. Is it permissible for a woman whose husband has already died for another woman to come and shower that woman? So instead of her showering herself, he she's getting somebody else to come and shower her. So is it permissible? Did I get that right, Hamdulillah? Thank you. As we know, we have been installed in Surah Al Asr to support each other through the problems of life. And truly, one day, death will come and take me first or my wife, as we never know, and leave one you know, still on the nest to take care of the case, and it is a nociva. And the society has to interfere, and every man should become the husband for the widow, the father for the orphans, 
It was some of the things that Hammurabi you know, believes long time ago. You know, he used to feel proud that you know, I was a husband for the widow, I was a father for the, uh, the orphans, I helped those who wanted to cross the river in my boat, and so on. It is a human quality. You know, and simply, as you know that, it is part of the marriage life loyalty. You know, when the husband passes away, it is it also it is a religious teaching, which is not subject to when we want to do things. It is a subject to what? When we say Samina wa Atona, part of the loyalty of the wife. To remain and I doubt as we can see this, one should be always clean. Aida does not mean a woman doesn't have shower. So you have to have shower. Because she has to pray. And when you pray, you have to be clean. She has to make wudu, and so on. So not part of the idda to not to have shower, but not to use perfume in another way. Do not express in a way that you are happy with your husband's death. That was me. Do not go out there and show him with parties and so on, just like the man who died means nothing to you. That was the idda. At the same time, do not get married unless that it occurred passes away. Because Islam is so serious in the blood ties. Everybody has the right to know who is my father and what are my religious duties towards my father or my mother. So within that period, the rahim also will be clear anyway, if there is any pregnancy or something like that. But the idda means for the woman not to express happiness due to her loyalty. But not to go for more than that, because people used to be in the past, once this happened, the woman will never come out, never have shower, never clean, and even the society will boycott her. She becomes just like a container in the house and waiting for her death. Not in Islam. It was a culture. It was a way of life for many people. Islam said, no, you can express that, but up to that limit, four months and ten days. After that, you go back to your normal life. Because Mosiba will come and go. But for her loyalty towards the husband, she needs to do that. And she can go out when she has nobody else to fulfill her needs. She wants something, for example, necessarily, and nobody there to do that. She can go out and come and get that and come back. But the idea is that to mourn the husband you know, for this period. And but to get somebody else to shower her, unless somebody is disabled, you know, we should shower ourselves. And, uh, but when somebody is disabled, then we can say, okay, somebody come and make audio for me. Somebody come and wash my body. Otherwise, no, no part of the idea uh, to do that. You look after yourself, or start saying simply, you don't get married. You don't beautify yourself out there, just like you're telling to any man, just come and get me, my husband is dead. Look, I'm ornamenting myself, all this is an idea. At the same time, for the family blood ties to be very clear. Otherwise, she should shower herself, but unless she is disabled, that's not only up to her. someone who is an idiot, anybody. If I can clean myself, I ask somebody who can do that for me, which is fine. Allah ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any more questions from the men? Yes. Many. Very good. No, I'll just say it because I have a Yes. Yeah. Sit for the mic. For the, the mic, for the ladies, inshallah. My question is very simple, it's not a political question, but it's a very serious question. It's a connection of the Arab Spring that movement, especially Syria. You can see the Saudi and the Qatar supporting the rebels. You can see Iran and Hezbollah in Lebanon supporting the Assad government. And these are all two, two Muslim countries. My question here is, you see this here, the Sunni. The Saudis and the Qatars are the Sunnis. No, the Iranians and the Hezbollah are shared. So I'm asking, is Prophet Muhammad so, Salah a Sunni, Muslim, Amadis, or Alwat? So, in another word, to define the Prophet Muhammad Salah, who is he? And in order to know something more clearly, is to go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially about Prophet Muhammad, 
No. He has been called many times in the Quran, and his name is mentioned in the Holy Quran five times. One of the five places, the introduction about him to the rest of mankind, Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Walladinamahu and those with him are very tough and powerful against the kuffar when the kuffar starts their aggression towards the Muslims. Very kind and merciful among themselves. So what we get from here, who is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He is the Messenger of Allah. To who? To all mankind. And those who follow him, who are dead, Ashida, if they want to prove that they are really powerful people, they don't show it to their Muslim brothers. To the kuffar who are aggressive. Not all the kuffar. The kuffar are to be protected under, under the law of Islam. Because Islam came for the kuffar. Muhammad came for the kuffar. And he was sent to the kuffar. And he turned this kuffar into Sahaba. And those who are with him, Ashida, they are very hard and powerful against the kuffar who are aggressive. Merciful and kind among themselves. You can see them. Ruka'an, sujjadan, in their salat. Sujud and ruku. Yaqtabuna fadla min Allah wa ridwana. سيماهم في وجوههم من أثر السجود. You can even recognize them through the salat. The salat will cultivate a true Muslim to someone who you want to be with. That's what the salat does. It will make you the most humble person you can imagine of. That's what salat does. It will unite you to the rest of all those who say La ilaha illallah Muhammad. That's what salat does. The unity of Allah. The unity of mankind. Wa inna hadhi ummatukum ummatan wahida. This is your nation, your people, one nation. Wa ana rabbukum faabudu. And I will also worship me. So this is what I am telling us. Who is Muhammad? Muhammad or Rasulullah? And another ayah. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim bi rijalikum. Wa la ka Rasulullah wa khatam al Nabiye. Muhammad was not. A father of any of you men, but he is the Messiah of Allah and the seal of the prophets. The only right way to talk about him is to say Muhammad or Rasulullah. It does not matter how many times we say he is great, he is genius, he is that, he is that. We are wasting our time. We need to say he is the Messiah of Allah. That's what he belongs to. And another ayah. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِّلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ كَفَّرَ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ وَأَصْلَحَ بَالَهُمْ And those people who believe in Allah and do good deeds and they believe in what was revealed to Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah forgives them their sins and He puts them in the best position to learn Akhirah So Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم again and the other place about Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in the tongue of the Prophet Isa عليه السلام Jesus Christ. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَ مِنَ التَّوْرَةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ. Just make it short. I'm confirming the Torah to you, and also give you the good news about the Prophet who will come after me, and his name is Ahmad, the praised one, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is his name again. And, and we know that what has been said in the Quran, it has been said before the Quran. No wonder, you know, as I told the people in the Canberra, why in 19, 1963 to 1978, why uh, uh, Pope Paul the sixth he chanted his words towards Islam and he accepted Islam and he told the Christian no more to go to the Muslim world to preach Christianity. 
because part of what he read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was discovered in 1958, was what? Ba'da al Arabi. After the Messiah, an Arab prophet will come. Min Biladi Faran. From Hijaz. Faran is a Hijaz area. Matimaka Matizat area. Wa'ala al-Yahudi al and the Jews should follow him. Wa'ala Maduhu, the sign that he is a awaited prophet is that Annahu in Najam in al Qatil, Fahua and Nabi Ul Muntadab. If you can escape that, he is the awaited prophet. The Annahu Yaflatu in a safe and Masu al Qabatihi, because he will escape the soul that will put in his neck, and then he will come back later with 10,000 cents. When the Pope read that, we can say he accepted Islam, but then he was poisoned. And a few days later, he died in unknown circumstances. Why? Because he told the truth. So that's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now, and before I start to answer this question, uh, there was a, uh, a well-known joke, and I will call it a joke because I don't know if it was true, that you know, two people were uh, fighting, one Sunni and one Shia. You know, and then the, the Sunday said, you know, one day the Prophet he went to the mosque of the Shia and he prayed there and when he came out he found his shoes was gone. <laughs> and then the Shia said, but there was no Shia in the Prophet's time. That is it. So where did you come from then? Who worked honestly with his brothers 
until his time came. So it's a fitna, it was political things, and we can say today. Where this one came from? It is came from divide and rule. If you want to rule people, divide them. When we have been warned in the Holy Quran, never to be divided. Hold on all together to the rock of Allah and never be divided. What is the rock of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet explained this. I left you with something very clear. And if anything, any differences happen, and you are confused, because if you live long, you may go through confusion. But don't be confused. Why? Because the Quran is there for you, and the way I did it is there for you. And you want to remain a Muslim, you hold on to that. And anybody else, whatever they do or they say, you display it on that. If it is, it, it met with that, you follow. If it doesn't, you don't have to follow, follow anybody's idea. And all the Khulafa, everything was fine, but as we can see now, it is a political move to divide the Muslims. Otherwise, this thing is, what is the, what is the meaning of the word Shia? It means the supporters. We remember when Uthman bin Affan, he was killed wrongfully. Troublemakers. And from that day, the Musiba in the Muslim world, that is where the division started, when Uthman was killed wrongfully. And he was reading the Quran. And he told the Sahaba, you believe in Allah? Yes. You believe the Prophet said, you must follow your Amir, you need a yes. In whatever he order you, as in accordance with Allah's teaching, yes. My order to you, don't fight back. If they want me, let them come and get me. I don't want any blood shed in my name. And he gets set in his room reading the Quran. But the troublemakers were out there. Abdullah bin Salam, a Jew, scholar, who became a Muslim. And he came and he told these people, don't ever use violence to solve a problem. If you take the soul out of the, she was just a shit. The self, yeah. I don't say from the house of the soul, the self, if you take it out to solve a problem in Islam, it will never go back in. It will be like that. And prove that what happened. And Usman was killed, the division started from there. Who killed Uthman? And who is responsible for his blood? You know, now in Abin Farah is Usman's wife, took her fingers, which was cut when they're killing Usman, and Usman's head and his kameez, she took it all the way to Syria to give to Mu'ad. Mu'ad, you are responsible for his blood. You are his relative, blood ties. And of course, Ali was a Khalifa. And Mu'ad, we want to know, I want to kill the people who killed Uthman. And he said, look, 3,000 people involved. We need to come down. Because it is better to make a mistake when you are forgiving, not to make a mistake when you are punishing. 3,000 people involved, and you can't just kill 3,000 people like that. We need to know who did what. So calm down, go back to, you know, to Syria, everything will be fine. Every apart, done, you go to sleep, tomorrow go back to Syria, and everything will be fine there. But when they are sleeping, what happens? The troublemakers, they couldn't wait. They start with a fight. Anyway, I mean, we can't see where the fitness start from. It, it is a musiba that made people who love Allah and love each other their fault. And remember the stand of Ali bin Abi Talib with the Zubayr. When the Zubayr was with the army of Muawiyah against Ali. And before the fight start, Ali went to Zubayr. And they're facing, facing, face to face with each other. And Ali said to a Zubair, a Zubair, you gonna fight me? Say yes. Zubair, do you remember the day you and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met me? Two of you met me. And the Prophet smiled to me. And I smiled back. What did you say that day? You say, oh Ali, you are a snob, you are a snob, jokingly. What did the Prophet say to you? The Prophet said to you, O oh, Zubayr, Ali is not a snob. And I swear by Allah, one day you are going to fight him, and you are wrong. Do you remember that? Zubayr said, yes, I do. 
as the by wisdom, he left the battlefield. I mean, it was a fitna. The prophet told them what is about to happen, but they couldn't believe a day will come. Those people who are saying about them, radiyallahu anhum wa radu anhu, will use their swords against each other. It was a musiba, and the ulama told us the best. Allah saved our swords and our blood from it, which will save our tongue. It is a fitna that happened. But what we see today, Shiaism is different to Shia. Sunnism is different to Sunni. We can see people use terms now to divide people. Otherwise, if she are made to love the Prophet of and his family, every Muslim has to prove that every day. Part of our salah, we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala al Muhammad. If it means for me to claim to be from the Prophet Muhammad's family, it's nothing to do with that. Bilal was not from the Prophet Muhammad's family, but he became through what? Through Islam. Abu Lahab, out. Why? It is his uncle. Abu Talib, out. Why? Salman, from Persia, from Iran, came over to Medina. And what the Prophet said about Salman? When Salman was sitting there and everybody was saying, hey, I'm an Arab, and this is my family tree, and these words, this is our tribe, and Salman didn't know what to say. What he said? Abil Islam ula abali siwahu, in iftakharu bi qaisin aw tamim. If you are proud with your dead parents, you are proud to that your culture, I'm proud of Islam. Islam is my only father. And the Prophet came out and he said, Salman minna al bayt. Salman is from my family. So if you are proud with yours, you will be proud of, part of his family. So this is what we can say. That if she is me to be follow the scholars from the Prophet Muhammad's family, Jafar Sadiq was. And Jafar Sadiq, he didn't pay different to Imam Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was one of the students of Jafar Sadiq. They never had issues. But nowadays it is hatred that make people turn this against each other, not Islam. <laughs> Otherwise, there's one thing unites us all. It is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything else is jahiliya. That was what I It is jahiliya. Regardless of what it is. But it is a fact. For propaganda's sake, we have to accept it is happening. There is Alawis, there is this and that. And when you say Islam, and what makes one a Muslim, when they follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way Abu Bakr did, Omar, Uthman, Ali, we call them Muslims. And every Muslim will be questioned on the judgment day about the Quran and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not Abu Bakr, not Omar, not Ali, not Uthman, no, about these two sources. And that's what we need to talk about when we talk about Islam, so that we don't make it long and go into the political debate throughout the history. But there is no such thing, there is one thing, Quran and Hadith makes their followers someone who are Muslims. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Imam. Just to clarify, there are just a few things that Imam mentioned about Islam. Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to the Kufar just to make sure he meant that Wama arsalna ka illa rahmatil alameen. You know, he was sent to propagate Islam for those Kufar to convert to Islam. And it's our responsibility to do so where we live today to propagate Islam. With those, uh, again, with the to topic of Shia, Sunni, we just need to learn from this that we are very minority as Africans. If we start dividing ourselves, starting going, we go in this, with this group, we go in with this group, where we are going to lose big time. I think what we need to work on is to work on towards what we have, work on towards holding one another other and promoting Islam among ourselves and among our community. There is no need for division. We are too small to divide ourselves. We are very, very small to divide ourselves. So let's hold that as one thing that Imam have just said to us. Division will take us nowhere. Inshallah. The next question, we have two more questions and then Inshallah we will give Imam a break and so we can interact and ask more questions there too. Uh, the next question here is, is it, what's the the ruling or the conditions or of someone who always, whether it's the wife or the husband, does always get angry within the family and angry on the basis of seeing just monetary affairs. 
you get to a point where where you tell the husband or so you tell the wife, I don't want you out of anger, you go away. I don't like you. What is the what is the ruling on that? Um when you finish not asking the question. Did I get that right? Did I get the question right? Yeah, yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. So what's the ruling of someone just getting angry and annoyed and just telling the wife regularly, I don't want you to go out of my life, I don't like you, you know? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulia wa ala alayhi wa sallam ala alayhi wa This is a, we can just call it, you know, it is the reaction of emotion. Because things in Islam are very clear. There are some things that we cannot, regardless, you are joking or you are serious, they are always serious. And one of them is, you know, our men's cars. And until somebody says, you know, calls the wife and say, you are divorced. The word divorced. The ones that only say it, we call that the separation. I don't want you, you know, get out of my life, all of these things. It doesn't give any message. It's still emotion. If the wind comes to the people, it's very serious. You just have to say you are divorced. Why is that? We don't say that. They could do anything. We say, look, I didn't mean that. I was angry and I said, I don't want you. And we say this from time to time. Even a boss can say to the employee, I don't want you anymore. And he didn't mean it. He can say, okay, I will call you, I was angry, please come back. And when it comes to these things, it is a very serious issue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we never know in our social life which one will make us go or, or, or win. But one has to be clear. If you have want to give a message to the wife, we we'll make it because a woman is to be looked after by two. No. The parents or the husband. These are the two men are responsible for her. And the parents look after until she is in the hand of the husband. And if I know that it is somebody else's daughter, I'm not going to be the right man. I should make it clear, make things clear, no confusion yet. So the parents know what to do next. Yeah. But this word is doesn't really give any message. It's still emotional and action uh, reaction yet. Yeah. that we don't take it as a divorce. And we do our best actually to avoid the divorce. If the man says, I didn't mean it, and he didn't say the word divorce, we forget about it. It's not a divorce. It gets emotional and reaction. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, of those people, I forget, the ladies had a question. Can a woman go to hack without the husband? Very simple, because I know that. What is the age limit? What is the age limit to go to hack? And can a woman go to hack without the husband? And I know the Imam says two questions, but Chairman, I think we've got three more, so we, Imam can still have one more. Okay. Let's see. First of all, as we know that, the woman, you don't need, you don't need to go to hack without a husband or a man. So this is another condition for hack to become compulsory on a woman if you have the man. If you don't have it, you don't have to go to hack anyway. But some of them are say she can go like Imam Shafi with a trustworthy group of women or trustworthy group of men who are trustworthy. And we can see the facilities are there and you are moving with people who are fully responsible, everything will be fine. No, not individuals. I mean, I can say, look, I'm a good man and I will take that woman with me to Hajj. It has to be a trustworthy group as ladies and this becomes Ishtihad anyway. And welcome to Ishtihad of the Ulama. Anybody can say, no, I don't agree with that anyway. I, I don't trust any man or something like that. I don't trust any woman. So it's not something we have a limit to it. How far we can trust somebody? But when the Ulama work hard to give a ruling in Islam, it's, now it is back to you. How do you take it? As long as you don't do it out of your desire, you base on what the Ulama say. Otherwise, originally, you don't have to go to hide and has not compulsory on you if you don't have the mahal. That is the first thing to know. But if you really want to go, and this is what has been said among some of the ulama, you go with the trustworthy group of people. Not the ulama, all of them say that. What is mahal? What is mahal? Mahal is a man that is trustworthy. Mahal is a man that cannot get married to you. Just because he is a brother, or grandfather, or uncle, and so on. Someone who cannot get married to you, they are mahal. His uncle's son, a mahram, or uncle's son. You mean cousins? You're talking about two cousins. They are mahram? Two cousins now, because 
two, two cousins can get married each other. They are not married there. And back home, it is impossible. For example, I cannot get married to my brother's son or something like that. And this is, or my, my son cannot not get married to my brother's son. And this is a culture. But religiously, you know, they can get married. But sometimes, you know, the culture makes things that become very difficult. But in the religious law, it is fine. But sometimes to avoid fitna, you don't have to do what you don't have to do because you're going to cause a fitness in this place to go. Otherwise, really, just leave nothing wrong here. No two cousins get married. Age, what are the age to go to Hajj? Once you are valid, it means the Mukallaf. Valid because this is the time a kid, you don't have to go to Hajj. But once you are a Mukallaf, it has to do with your age. You know, say from 15 up, the person is valid. And so on. But below that, when you're a kid, even if you perform Hajj when you are a kid with your parents, this, we don't call that the Hajj of Islam. We have to do it again later, when Islam becomes compulsory on you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question here, it's quite, uh, it's one, but it's kind of a double one, you know, they call it double one question. Those that come to you. No, exactly. This one is, what is Islam? What is, what is Islam or what is, what is, what is Deen? And uh, part of that question says, is it permissible for someone to just call a nation called Kufar? It's say this whole entire come to the Kufar, or just on what base can somebody call someone a Kafir? Okay, that's the one question. But uh, the second question of that says, what is the naked part of the man or a woman? What is the hour to register or mark? What is the naked part of a man? Or what are the policies or conditions of conditions of that man and woman who left the part they need to cover on cover? <coughs> What is Islam? On what is Deen? On, on what base can somebody call someone Kafir? Or do any Muslim who have the right to just say the entire nation is a Kafir? Or just say, ah, this is a far On what base there? Because you are here at the church. The Deen is Islam. And the Holy Quran said it clearly. When you talk about Deen, and he confirmed it with Inna. Inna Deen Ain't Allah in Islam. There was only one team. And what is that? The moment you surrender fully and decide to live your life according to Allah's will, then you can call yourself a religious man. Inna dina and Allah in Islam. And the differences came later for propaganda reasons. Otherwise, you know, I mean, in Islam we can see you try to find a name for any religion, and I don't really want to go to that field because it takes us back to you know, religious uh, names and so on. Waman yabtari ghayr al-Islam yadinan falam yuqbala minhu. Anyone who adopts other than Islam as a way of life, it will not be accepted from them. Then we need to what is Islam? Islam is when the Prophet Isa alayhi salam told mankind that he came with good news from him, from the Creator. And if you follow that, you will be saved. So what you are telling the people, there is something you need to give up your way of life and adapt that. And if you do that, that means you surrender to him and obey him. And in Arabic, we call that Islam, submission. And Jesus Christ himself submitted, and he called his follower to do the same, pray and fast and follow what he wants. So that is Islam. So the only name for that deal in Arabic is Islam. Before that, in the time of Musa alayhi salam, he came with a message to mankind. And he told them to follow that, to pray and worship the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in Arabic is Islam. So this is the only deal. And any other names we brought, we follow them up, we will see where did I start from. And every day we can see a religion pop up. So many is made now. And we call everything now a religion. But when we talk about religion, it is the one that also will define for mankind. The one that will make you submit and surrender and live your life according to God's will. We call that the team. There's only one. And all the prophets, they came to remind mankind with that. So we call. And if we reject that, what will happen? You know, he become Kafir. 
And what's cattle? And also when we say cattle, there are two types of cattle. Somebody who is a, who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all, a pagan. They don't, they worship idols and so on. And Islam told us, do not treat them with the people who are doing their best to worship Allah, but they get it wrong. They was following a book, we call them the people of the book. The Jews and the Christians. But at the same time, the Quran is telling us, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ Which means they are kafir. But what category? Ahlul Kitab. They have a special uh, position that we have to know that. And don't treat them like people who don't believe in God, don't believe in a book or a prophet. And this is a, a reality. And if somebody doesn't believe, for example, you know, in, in, in any religion, and then you call them a religious person, they will be angry. Because they are not. So it is right to call people these are them that they really belong to. If somebody is a Christian or you, say, look, Islam told us to work together with you on what we agree. And what we disagree, Allah will charge us. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْ إِلَىٰ كِلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْدُنَا بَعْدًا عَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِنَا I mean, this is, Islam told us to talk. Talk to the people, let them know who you are and what you got. And use this word as a market. You display what you got. If people want it, they buy it. Don't try to shove it in the people. Don't try to impose on people now. But we share it with them. And if anyone Allah have written for them his divine hidayah, they will get it. How we see every day people who are coming into Islam. Not because they have been forced, because they are studying and they love it and they come into it. So we call them the people of the book. This is the Jews and the Christians. Others, we call them Catholic. And this is a name, not to defend them. And if I know that calling somebody a Catholic will make us lose the ties, because Islam told us to invite mankind to what is the best for them. And I don't believe you can insult somebody and then invite them again. So it is something we need to know, the art of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Udhu ila sabili rabbi bil hikmah wal ma'idati al hasana wa jadiluhum billati hiya asana. And I always tell the people, some people they want to know the truth. And when I talk to uh, some uh, Christian or to anybody, from the beginning I say, we have to be honest to each other. You know, if I tell you, I'm a Muslim, you're a Christian, all of them are completely different, at the same time, the, both of them are right and lying to you. Because it's not true, because you are not a Muslim, you are not. I'm not a Christian now. And I say, we all are the same, and you're going this way, I'm going that way. That means I'm lying to you, I'm not the true brother to you as a human being. And we need to be honest with each other. To admit it, it doesn't mean I'm putting it down, I'm just saying we are different. And differences is our right. Even mistakes, everybody has the right to make a mistake. And we have the right to be corrected in the nice way. That's how Allah made us. And the Prophet ﷺ, that's how he was. He gave everybody the chance to come to know the truth. He did not react the way they did. Because he knew Allah sent me for you, all of you. And he was available for everybody. So when we talk about the deen, we just put that in our mind. People are to be respected and beliefs are to be, not to be imposed, but to be displayed to people and let them use their own head to think. Because Allah wants us to be ourselves. And when you are to be slave, only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to a human being at all. And the second, part. And the second question was about the hour to regime at the Walmara. And what are the no, the dress code? The dress code. Yeah, the dress code. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the true uniform for a Muslim, uh, as we know that, you know, when we read the books of Frederick, you know, from the belly button to the knee, that must be covered. And when you go further, you know, in some of the Maliki scholars, the servant sometimes your thigh is not our. I mean, all of this, but when you can really see. The majority say you are aura from your belly button to the knees because the aura of the man. Don't let anybody see that part. Now, what will happen? You cover from your belly button to the knee. If you go beyond that, you are sharing your privacy with some people, other people. So you don't have anything private anymore. And, and for, for the woman, and, and this is to do with the ibadah, our moral ibadah in our life. 
and the one who created the human human body and told us, I made this body for you, part of this part and that part and that part. And believer would say, Yes, Allah gave the whole world to me, and he gave us the clothing. Ya Bani Adam, Kot Amzanna Ilaikum Libasan, Yuari Sau Atikum Warisha, Walibasu Takwa Dalika Khoi. This article is the purpose of dressing. What is the first purpose? You worry so article to cover your aura. And, and then, you know, to protect yourself from the heat, from the cold, but the main thing, to cover your aura, your, naked, your nakedness. And for a woman, as you know, all the orb, as you can see, everything to be covered except the face, you know, and the two parts, and some also with the feet from the person below. This is a great happen among all the Muslim scholars. But some say also the face has to be covered. That's not agreed great happen, which means some say no. And, when you, and this is different only among the uh, uh, present Muslims, even among the Sahara. What is the meaning of illa ma dohara minha? What is apparent by necessity and so on? But that's what some say. Although the woman cover everything except the face and the palm is fine. But to go further, that another you know, dispute among them, no, they have to cover the face. But a Muslim woman knows these two things. The difference between these two. Do we have to cover the face or not? But anything below that, we know that we leave our hour our, our out. So the only visible thing should be the face and the eyes. But to go further, some of them say no, we have to cover the whole world. This is between these two. And wherever you follow scholars, you don't do it from your own desire, you are doing the right thing. Because all our scholars are make mistakes. And once we realize they made a mistake, their will to us, once we realize I made a mistake, you must go back to the truth. Because what we say is not deen. What we say is ishtihad. The deen is what Allah said and the Prophet And the direct students are those who know it. An announcement, please. Are someone's two power ibad. And we know that when I came to Darwin, the first the first dead body I had to deal with as a newcomer into the city was a little child, a little girl. And truly, usually when a little girl dies, the ladies will prepare the body and so on, and then give it to the men to, to bury him. But when you see a picture, that makes you cry. You know, three years old little girl, and the lady washed body everything, and they put the, the scarf on her. You can really see, is this what, how we want to go back to Allah? In a picture that he wants us to keep in our lifetime, because many people really they didn't discover that yet. They think when they talk about Islam, it is they call it modesty, and modesty is not hijab. Hijab is a divine uniform from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It is described in the Quran and the Sunnah. Modesty, what is modest to me, it could not be to that person. It's different. For some people, modesty is up to the knees. Make sure. Don't go above. Some people to have hooks that are some people. So there is no criteria for modesty. But Islam didn't say modesty, it said hijab. And it started with the most good feeling man and to his wives and his daughters and then those who claim to be believers. What it says, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, O Prophet, only as wajika, tell your wives, wabanatika and your daughters, what is mu'minin and the wife of the believers. Yudinina ali hinna min jalabibi him to lower their jalba on them. And how it was, it is fully explained because the ayah they talking to people and they practice that very simply. And then they pass it on. What I also used to say to the ladies in the eyes of the Prophet's wife, some girls they are coming to her to visit to visit to Aisha, and then she will tell them, Why are you dressed like that? It looks like you don't read so much to know. This is not the dress of the woman who believes in Surah to know. So she is to tell them how to dress properly. But everyone needs to just know that. Just make sure what men can see from you no more than the face you know, and your palms and the <coughs> of the feet. Yeah. This is order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're praying to Allah for our heart to go to Sujood. Once our heart goes to Sujood, everything is easy to practice. Because we do that because we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much, Imam. There's one. Oh, that's Yes. No, 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 no. That's okay. I think that's covered. Our cash input. Our cash input. Our.
punishment. No, no, it's okay. Uh, the punishment of the one that didn't cover. Once, okay, we'll go by that and then we'll give you the last question. For, for more. Okay, that's okay. If the Cambodians want to ask, we'll go ahead. We have no, no hurry. We'll pray as we soon, inshallah. Uh, let's do the punishment of the not covering your body and then we'll go for your question. I hope the ladies are listening, please. I hope the ladies are listening. I will go for that. We'll go for the, the, the mercy punishment. The mercy. The mercy. The, let's go for the mercy. The mercy. You know that the type of mercy in Burkina and this is it. And, and, and I, I guess I have a mercy tail. <laughs> So it is a footsteps of shaitan. So 
So why I say always the most beautiful flower on earth is a young person who fear Allah. Because it is the most difficult time of challenges religiously and we can see it. But this is a place for jihad. When we can make it, I'm here, I will take the best out of Australia. And I will remember Allah sent me here as an ambassador of Islam. At least if I fail in some things, I don't want to carry the sins of other people. These people look at the haram because I display it to them. We don't want to be like that. And the Holy Quran said, وَيَحْمِلُونَ أَوْزَارَهُمْ وَأَوْزَارًا مَا أَوْزَارِهِمْ They carry their own sins and other sins that they cause. So we need to be very careful. We just listen. Use the uniform that Allah has given to us. Because if any boss tell me, you must come to work with uniform, and they put it like that, we we'll automatically follow that. If any school will follow the uniform, how come we reject the uniform of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because he means nothing to us. That is the only meaning. That when we don't mean it, when we say, Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest in my life. It is not true because I met, I met his deen as a victim when I have two choices. So this is ibadah for us. And just remember, we have one chance on the two. Do things the way Allah told us. It is our lifetime. We're going to live once. And once we go, the chances are over. So we have no time to waste. And in the end of our life, at the moment of death, all the beautiful joy we went through, it will become the past, it's gone, and the suffering will start. That was the past. So what is the point? I enjoyed my life, but then now I'm dying. What will help me? We think of that moment, it can help us when we be good people. Thank you now, Shule, and then we'll go to our bar with the last bar. Um, Barry, we've got one, two, three, and that's, that's it. Yeah, three, not three, not three, you, not three, you. Three. 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 For a Muslim woman or man to marry, and if so, what is the age limit you you supposed to be married? At? And uh, the other question is, uh, are you gonna like uh, is Islam because you like your your wife? Uh, Islam permits you to sit and see your wife doing the wrong thing in the house, then you keep going with that because you love your wife. So I'm like more than you. First of all, yeah. the daughters of all ladies, you know, the, the social life and the closest. The closest human being to me, who knows me in and out, is my wife. The closest human being to me, who knows me in and out, is my husband. So we are the reliable witnesses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on each other. Remember one day when the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam told the Sahara, Antum shuhada Allahi fil am. You are the witnesses of Allah on earth. It's very important for every human being to win anyone who will meet in our life and make sure that on the judgment day they will stand up and say oh allah i know that person i live with that person they're good that's their goal allah will say allah will say i accept your testimony and your witness and i forgive the person what you don't know about him or about her that's how important for everyone of us start to win everybody that come to know you. Make them to argue for you on the judgment they not against you. And the closest people, of course, is when we share our life in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is a mehta, 
using it back home when we, people used to get married. Uh, the two families would get together and the elderly people in the village and we said the Quran. Uh, the verses that reminded us with the new term of life we are about to go in. To remember that love, the word love is not only your property to go through your man's life. It is a it is a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the responsibility. Because for many people the only thing that makes them get very I say, I love you, you love me, full stop. Mm. When they go into the men's life and then discover the shortcomings, you know, the mistakes, and then, I mean, truly when you go, you go to the court nowadays, most of the problems are husband and wife, parents and kids, husband and wife, parents and so on. How come? What's wrong with the boys of Adam? They are not good anymore for the daughters of Hawa. What's wrong? I used to say the words, I love you, I do anything for you, I do this, and so on. And all of a sudden, take each other to the court, fight for this, and so on, cursing each other, using the kids as weapons to shoot each other, this is a musiba. This is a musiba. But, you guys need to remember, this woman who I took in the name of Allah from her parents, she may be the barrier between me and Jannah, because I did wrong to her. And maybe nobody knows. Or this man, who I took from his parents and called my husband, he may be the barrier between man and Jannah. Only Allah knows. So it is a big responsibility, and we have to make sure we don't do wrong to each other. That's the means that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but it happens here. Yeah. And who is married? What is the hukum or the law of marriage in Islam? Marriage is, becomes compulsory. If I see myself, if I don't get married, I'm going to do something haram. Then I have to get married. If I know that, look, marriage is sunnah. And we are, Allah made us for each other. And the proof is that he made Adam and then he made Hawa. And they got married and then the family grew. Kids moved out, became a village, became countries, continents. But we all are one. The human being to exist through the system of marriage. Through marriage, the ambiya will born, the awliya will born through that contact. It is something we have to respect. So it is compulsory. If I know that, if I don't get married, I may commit zina. Then I have to get married. And the Prophet said, "Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, O young people." Man istatoa alin kumul bay ata fala tizawat. If you found yourself able to marry, you are ready financially, physically, social and so on, don't wait any longer. Go and get married, you will save your religion. Otherwise, a moment of joy, you joy for a few seconds, you know, and you capture yourself with the flames of the sea. Not good for you. So we must marry if we say ourselves we commit a sin. Otherwise, it is optional. You know, you know one of the scholars who didn't get married, for example? Imam Nawawi. He didn't get married. He didn't get married. And he's one of the scholars. When you go to any group of Islam, you will see that they are reading his books. And he lived only for 40 years. Imam Nawawi. I'm one of the good people. The artists are here, Imam Nawawi, Musa, Fodi Abi, and so on. But then you can see uh, Azkar, the Nawawi, to be accepted like that. Sometimes I write a book and you can't even get somebody to read it. And if someone read it once, they will never read it again. But the people who Allah accept their work, what they have done remains a light for mankind throughout the history. And you read, you never heard enough from what they say because they wrote it with the blood of their heart and the tears of their eyes with the fear of Allah. And that's why from heart to heart, this is the only who and accept the work in Shah Allah. So, if I know that, look, I will not commit a sin, and for some reasons I will not get married for this and that, you are against the Sunnah. And the Prophet told this three men like that. One man, he said, I will never get married. I will just give my entire life to Allah. I don't want to have a wife or kids. I will just make myself for Allah. And the other one said, I will just pray the whole night, never sleep. And the other said, I will fast every day. 
That's a proper saying there. I heard what you say. You know, I'm the one who taught you Islam. And I know Allah more than you. But I marry a woman, I sleep, and I wake up and pray, and sometimes I fast, and sometimes I don't. If you don't follow my sunnah, you are not part of me. And if I'm not part of him, then you are lost. You don't worship Allah with emotion. Worship Allah with ilm and follow the Prophet. Nothing to do with the quantity but the quality. That's what you know about Islam. Yeah. So, with words like that, you know, with the age, has a place role in that. And I don't know if we are in Sierra Leone, but back home, you know, I mean, some people say, look, oh, this girl get married very, very young. They don't understand. They try to judge a culture that they don't know. Just like many people, they try to talk about Islam and they don't know Islam. It's not fair to talk about something that you don't know. So culture, in with that, Islam is not against culture fully, but Islam makes you responsible. Some culture, the wife will grow in the, in the family of the husband, but both families are supervising them, taking care of them, until when they are ready. This is a culture. No problem as long wrong is not done to any party. It's fine. However, when people start to know what is men, you know, and then they're ready to go for it, still Islam said the guardian help your daughter to find the right man because women can be emotional and they take things the way they heard it, they trust, and they can fail you know, in the hand of a wrong man. That's how Islam puts the guardian to help her to get the right, not to force her. One of the conditions of marriage that is and Kabul. The boy has to agree and the girl has to agree. If they don't, the marriage doesn't go ahead. And the dowry is the girl's full right. The gift from the boy to the girl, it is her full right. Nothing to do with the parents or anybody else. Um, let me, that's our name, but God bless you, Imam. Thank you. I guess from what we understand from Imam, he says that we are not forced to get into marriage, but when we get into marriage at the same time, we need to be responsible. Imam, did I get that right? Again, you don't use force. If I have a woman and uh, we've married, we are both Muslim, my responsibility as a man, because the Quran said, My responsibility as a man is not to shout, anger, kick is to use my, te my, my intellect. Imam started something today by saying we, used to, we need to use our influence, our tact on how we can change people. So that's what we need to do. You can win with fight, we know that. So we need to use our tact, what? By educating our wives slowly, inshallah, get them to love Allah, to know the truth, they will change. Because again, we had it. We were not forced to say, I love you, you know, from what, how do they call it in English, help me? Wow. From better to, better to worse. Better to worse, you know what I mean? So if it is better and it becomes worse later, you as a man, you are a man, you are responsible for God's sake. Try and get that worse to become good and try do that with the guidance of the knowledge of people. Inshallah, with the advice of the Imams, try and do that and correct that. And we wish and pray so for all those that are having issues in their marriage, for Allah to make it easier and guide them both. Yeah, both. And the last part of his question, so what the age? What is the age? And when the, if the wife is doing, the, now the Imam is going to ask this part, if the wife is doing something wrong, and because you love the wife, can you just stay there? Yeah. That's the wife, the Imam is answering that one. If it's doing wrong because you love her, because you love her, and you, are you going to sit down there and see her doing the wrong thing against like, the Islam because of love? Or, 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 yeah, as we know, the love is a driving force you know, for us to go through things that we don't want to go. But because we love it, we do it. So we need to love. But love can be blind, as we know and love can kill, and love can destroy. You know, when Allah SWT told us, إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوْ وَلَّكُمْ فَحْرَرُهُمْ Among your wives or your husbands <coughs> and your are enemies to you, so be careful. You know, if I see, for example, my kid, he wants to drink the Panadol more than what he's supposed to, and I say no, and he's crying, 
I said, okay, I love you. Play as much as you want. That's why I'm killing him. I don't love this kid. You know? So maybe, is when you are able to say to your wife or your son, no, without losing them. In a way that they will get the message, in another way, to say it, the Prophet said, مَا كَانَ لَعُمْفُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَ وَمَا كَانَ بِثْفُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ Whenever violence is used, it will make things worse. And kindness will make things even better. The one of the saying is of a Gandhi. I used to say Mahatma Gandhi, which means a great Gandhi. I want to use them kids from India to say to me, Ima, don't say Mahatma Gandhi. If you say that you believe he is your religious reference, Okay, thank you. Yes, again, yes, again. But he said, non-violence is the first article of my faith, and it is the last article of my creed. So if you really want to get what you want, get there, but without violence. And that was the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi He never used it for anything. And he never put his hand on a wife or a kid throughout his life. And he got people ready, come to him willingly. You know, so with kids, Allah praise the Prophet Ismail. What go for the Kitab Ismail in the Hukara Sodic and Wadi, Wakara Sula Nabia, Wakana Yamu Ahla who be Salati was the Kati Wakana and the Rabbi Matia. He praised this man because he was one of the people who never forget to call his wife with him to Salat, or my wife Salat. And the Quran told us, Wakmu Ahla Kabi Salati was Tabiraniha. Tell your wife, you film to the salat and be patient again and again. It is a matter of saving somebody else's life. I mean, what is the point if I live with somebody and I love, I say, I love you everything? And on the moment of death, I realize that, you know who is this body going to the grave? It is a woman who used not to pray, or it is a husband who used not to pray, or a husband who used to do all the haram things, and I'm a witness for that. And the chances are over. Whatever the people do after that, it is out of emotion. But what only be useful to me is what I may do in my lifetime. So we need to be one husband and wife. And remember last night we had a talk. When somebody talked to us about paradise. You know, and how beautiful everything. And one of the beauty of paradise when you see uh, the whole life in paradise. You never see someone as that beautiful. And with that you see them around and then all of a sudden something else will take your eyes away. A woman behind them. And who is that woman? It is your wife who used to be with you in the dunya. She is better than the whole life. And Allah described in the Quran what men have in paradise. But he didn't describe what women have. People who don't know if you look Islam again, see, he tells the man who get this, what there for the woman? See, Islam. And say, look, who are you talking to? People don't know the Islamic culture and values. You know, in Islam, for example, if I say to my son, if you work hard, very good in the school of these things, I will get you the most beautiful woman to get married. My son will be say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do it. If I say that to my daughter, she may be angry with me. <laughs> because women don't want to use the type of things. You know, out of their, this is their nature and their shyness. So I have to find different to tell my daughter, if I said to you, look, you have that man, if I have that man, so look, why? They will run away. Yeah. So it is a respect to a woman. And when you don't understand, you, you have to study psychology. The human being, Allah knows them more than themselves. That's why you know how to talk about it. So when you talk about paradise, and the, all of a sudden you will be surprised with your, your wife in dunya. And somebody was saying, what? You will have to face this woman again? I have to look at dunya. <laughs> And then what I said, when a Zahana Mafi is to do him in the head, if one and the the hatred, the spitefulness that used to be in your heart in dunya. And we can see small example here. Sometimes I'm fighting with my wife, this, 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 this. And then if you see, oh, you, know, you know, the government gave to everybody uh, $20,000. We see, we start to love each other. Things are fine. It is problems makes the people frustrated, and they want to put the pressure on somebody. Not her fault, not your fault. It is life difficulties, and we have to fight together. 
Don't put the blame on somebody. Good news. We'll come and make them. They love each other. And maybe when the money finish again, it's not the blame each other. It's not like that. So we just need to remember to forgive each other. When we see paradise, believe me, it's always said that husband and the everything is over. So may Allah give us the power to go through the sober in order to be successful in our marriage life, our social life, and so on. Thank you, thank you, Imam. This is beautiful. Thank you. Now, the next question here we have is, is it uh, allowed for a Muslim man to be married to a Christian woman? And the opposite, I pose it again, is it allowed for a Christian, did I say first of all Muslim man? Yeah. To him, to, to marry to a Christian, yes. and the opposite. So, can a Muslim man marry a Christian woman? Can a Christian man marry a Muslim woman? That's one. And, um, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, the question I got. And part of that question also is the conduct. Just because a woman has a beautiful conduct, you know, she's, she's very well mannered, she's good, you know, she's high distinction, she's. No, so well to put everything because if she is not a Muslim, is a Muslim man allowed to marry her? Okay. If she's not a Muslim, but she's got good conduct and everything, she's well mannered. Can a Muslim man marry her? Is that, did I get that right? Yeah, sure, sure, please. Come next. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh. Uh, I really enjoy your lecture. You just. Uh, Compliment to um, you know giving us a real list. Uh, my, my my question is: um, Can a Muslim man marry to a non-Muslim based on her good pattern of conduct? Just on that, just based on her good pattern of conduct, is that enough for Islam to just marry to them? As, as we know that, what makes a Muslim or a believer different to a non-Muslim? Uh, uh, I'm saying that means just to give every human being their rights. For some people, for example, when they want to do something, they will go and look or what uh, Sigmund Freud said about it. For some people, what Karl Marx said about it. For some people, in France, what Victor Hugo said about it. For some people, you know, what uh, Malcolm X said about it. But for a Muslim, we have a reference for everything. Marriage, for example. What is marriage in Islam? Who allow us to marry each other? What is the only condition that a man and a woman can meet? Under what law? It is from Allah. You imagine if Allah told us a woman and a man and a woman cannot get married. They have to stay throughout their life, don't get married. A believer will say, yes, I will do that. I will tell them not to get married, I will not marry. We have to do this and this and that. Now he told us, marry. Also to marry to who? <coughs> to a Muslim is not a problem. Because a Muslim will never do things out of their desire. That means, This is talking about someone who makes their religion their desire. I do things the way I want and the way I feel. So they make their own desire, their religion, and they make themselves the God. But for a believer, he says, marriage itself, it is Allah who allow us. And he told us who you can get married and who you cannot. Hurimat alaykum, ummahatukum, wabanatukum, wa akhawatukum, wa ammatukum, wa khalatukum, wabanatul akh, wabanatul ukh, wa ummahatul akh. And all the ways, these people, marriage is allowed, but I cannot say, oh, look, no, people, please forgive me because. There is no woman on the whole universe who wants to get married me. So I, I will just get married to my own sister. No. You cannot, you cannot. This is a haram that's not flexible. You may say, look, I have to drink alcohol because I was nearly dead and nothing else to drink that is okay. They said it has no law. I have to eat pig because there was nothing else to save my life. Okay. I can say, I had to get married to my sister because nobody else wanted me. No. This haram, haram is not flexible. You cannot believe it. no under circumstances. So getting married in Senate is order from Allah, part of our iman. So a believer also still follows that rules. So a Muslim then, Allah told us in the Quran, Wala yeah. which means it's very clear, never 
you know, perhaps you pay or you give a Muslim, any of you female for men until they become a mommy. That is very clear. Which means a Muslim a woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. But some of say, look, what is the difference? They are human. What's wrong with them? Go ahead. It's up to you. But you will pay the price because this is Allah who made you and that man. And he tells the rules. But you can't say, look, you don't care. It's up to you. Because people can teach you, but they cannot force you. You want to see the result? You go ahead. But this is the Islamic law. And Islam is not there to follow our desire. If it is our desire, I was telling the people in Darwin, what can unite us is Islam. If you bring your culture, and I bring my Africans, I don't think we can be together in this masjid. But as Muslims, there is something unite us all. What is that? And every believer, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِينَ وَعَقَانَ The only answer for a true believer when Allah call them for something, they will say, we have and we will obey. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَقُولُ لَهُمْ لَخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ This is not that will never happen for a, a mu'min, male or female. If Allah says something, they say, look, it is my choice. We will never say that in Allah's order. So you can get married as a Muslim man to a Jew or a Christian. Any of the people of the book. But to someone who is not from the people of the book, no. But now, welcome to marriage now. Even Islam says, don't just get married to any woman. Before you get married, don't think of yourself. Think of your kids. What type of mother you want for them? What type of teacher you want for your kids? And you know that your wife is the first school for your kids. Don't just say any woman. What the Prophet said, people are getting married for three reasons, and four reasons. They marry the woman because she is beautiful, because she is rich, because she has high quality in this community. But what the Prophet advised is, first of all, without a day, you go for the one who knows Allah. You will win in your life. If you marry a woman who knows Allah, that's all you want. Because why sometimes we see a woman who will never have a husband? Why? Then she is the most beautiful. But we need to know what is the definition of beauty. Is it to do with the skin, with the words, with the behavior? Until you deal with somebody, then you can tell they are beautiful or not. And that's why we don't cover books with their color. We don't adjust books with their color, as we say. The same thing only when you enter into somebody's life, then you will come to know they are beautiful or not beautiful. But it is up to the man. Is this person a Muslim woman? Yes. Is a Christian? Yes. A Jew? Yes. You want to marry? Islamic, it is allowed. But you are responsible for who will be the man for your kids. Go for someone who knows Allah. Half of the work will be done for you. For you have a good family. So that was that. Ask us go for good people. Because we want to know the ruling of gambling, that's one thing. And the question says, can we use unclean gambling money? The thing is, what is unclean gambling money for you if I start? Can we use that money <laughs> to build the mosque or help the poor or send people to hide? Okay, that's one. Or build the school. And if someone is born, very born in a family, they're very wealthy, say, let's say, uh, what, Kerry Packer or someone there, those, those family, born really in gambling. But then, I'm just assuming here, God has touched their heart and they become Muslim. How do they claim that money? Yeah, I'm just assuming that's what you meant by this. You say, if, we are, if you are born in that wealth that is not clean, how do you claim it? If you're not a Muslim, I don't think you're going The first part is what's gambling, and can you use gambling money to do good? Yeah? And the second part is if you are born in a wealthy family and you need all this gambling money, how do you clean it? How do you make it clean? How do you make that money allowed? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, the first part of the question, what's the government? This is the first part of the question. 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 This is the first part of the question
I would just need to know gambling because we don't know gambling. That's what my, my brother, they call me. And I say, you know, the matter you sent to me, there is, they open a new box in our village, and that is a box, you put your money in it, and every day you will get a new baby. Oh. <laughs> Which means you have to talk about the interest anyway. Yeah. And gambling, I mean, as kids, you know, we used to go through it to get money because in the name of uh, games, you know, you put five franc and do this. If you win, you get two francs. If you lose, you lose your five francs. And all of this is gambling, you know, and the lottery, it's still gambling. And many people don't know that. They don't know yet. They still go, oh, you know, you do this one, the lottery, you win. Because they don't know. And the focus that money burns people. Many people don't realize, you know, money can burn you. That we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover us up and we shouldn't believe 100% it is money that will solve all my problems. We want Allah to cover us up. So anything to do with gambling, you know, is actually what the Holy Quran said in Surah Luqman. وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ رِبًا لِيَرْبُوَ فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ زَكَاتٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ if you really want your money to increase, not through the company, that's making your money less. And even that less, the barakah goes away. If you really want to increase your money, you give it away in salaka. That's what Allah said. And anybody may break their promise to you, but not Allah. And this is the way to increase our money. If you know the meaning of money. But when you believe, money is what we can see. Money is that what comes into my life, it becomes a problem. But it's a real money that what will stay with you when you get it. And all our money, when, when it goes, and what we consume through the clothes or shoes or food, but the real money for us is the one we send it ahead, donating and helping. But we remember, Allah will never claim death with death. So we cannot use haram money to earn something good. We, we don't do that. I mean, some of us say, for example, Look, you had this haram money was in your life, you don't know what to do with it, and so what you need to do, give it to the poor people, not as a sotaka, not as a donation, but the best way to get rid of it. Don't give it back to the bank, and don't use it for yourself, give it to people who really need it, but as a good way to get rid of it, not as a donation. It's fine. If you don't know what to, what to do with my interest, I'm putting my money in the bank, what do you want to Give it to the poor people who really need it as a way to get rid of it. Otherwise, because this money, what this not Tarun is money. The money made him challenge and he became someone who started to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was asking Allah to protect us from what we gave us. And protect us from what we didn't give us. We never know which one is good for me, what is with me or what is not with me. But it is one way to live it. Be on the land to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what the Prophet said, Ma uddira li ma adivayka al yamdagahu ma adiqa, famdukhu bi aiz la bidhin. Whatever is written that, you two Jews will chew it. Your provision, you will chew it. Nobody can take it away. So chew it with dignity and honor, not with lowness and in a bad way. So it is something that we will be away from. And if you are born in haram money, of course we can do okay. Necessity has no law. But the way to clean it up, you can say, I will get out of that, of the entire money. But is it practical? Necessity can allow you sometimes to use the haram until you stand on your feet. But once you realize, this is not money, this is poison. Regardless how thirsty I am, if there is a bit of drop of poison in the uh, glass of water, I will never drink it. This also is poison. And haram is a poison for my soul. Just like when this is a medicine is a poison for my body, haram money, haram food, haram behavior, haram relation is a poison for my soul, not good for me. And when you are wise, we should keep away from that. And we trust in what is in the hand of Allah. Whatever in your hand will finish sooner or later. And what Allah kept for you will stay forever. So that is our real haram money. For us. So it's haram, yeah? It's not true. Now, thank you very much. Before we pray, I know we have to pray. We want to say uh, thanks to Imam because all the way from Canberra to inviting us. And uh, inshallah, I will get our brother, particularly thank members for coming.
And uh, just going back to the first thing that our imam start with, that again, we are very small in numbers. We are minority. Let's stick to what will unite us, not what will divide us.